Hey, my name's Melvin, and I am your personal celery man. Welcome to Cinematic Doctrine's first episode, where we'll be covering 2014's It Follows. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my friends for voting this in as my first review. I was having difficulty picking something to start with, and I really didn't want to start with Captain Marvel, so this worked out. It Follows was one of the first few films I watched when I started to get into movies, you know. It was around the time a friend recommended The Babadook, and after watching that, we were eager to watch some more modern horror films. I have to say, out of the two, It Follows is my preferred. I find the film quite convicting, despite it being more of a coming-of-age tale than a declaration of celibacy. But before we get started, let's give some context. It Follows is directed by David Robert Mitchell, who previously directed The Myth of the American Sleepover, and just recently released Under the Silver Lake, both films that I seriously need to watch already. The story goes that Jay, played by Micah Monroe, sleeps with her boyfriend, then she's unsuspectingly knocked out and awakes tied to a wheelchair. Her boyfriend is seen pacing ahead of her and says, I just passed it to you and it's slow, but if it catches you, it will kill you. If it kills you, it will come back for me. It can look like anyone, and it, again, it may be slow, but it's not dumb. Just keep moving and pass it on as fast as you can. This film is rated R for disturbing, violent, and sexual content, including graphic nudity and language. Boy, you guys really know how to pick them. Right off the bat, I felt it would be good to elaborate on the adult content in this film, and then share my thoughts on the topic of adult content as a whole. The nudity in this film, although completely unnecessary, does seem to have some sort of narrative value. For instance, the only nudity is when it's the creature. I think there's something to say about the fact that the thing that's going to kill you is the same thing that's, on occasion, trying to attract you. That said, most shots are from a distance and are largely non-provocative, nor are they attractive. I mean, this thing looks like a person but functions like a monster and it makes for some frightening sequences. And that's not to say that the creature is always naked, because it's not. There's a fair amount of scenes in which it's clothed, and the naked scenes are few and far between. And on the other side, considering the premise of the film, the moments of sex are relatively tasteful and covered. The initial sequence is probably the most offensive, and even then the characters are clothed, albeit in underwear. It honestly comes down to what you're comfortable with, but because torso and below are covered during these sequences, there is a sense of respect for the actors and those watching that otherwise might not be present in other films. Perhaps the most offensive is a sequence in which a character finds an inappropriate magazine. I think for both my wife and I, we found that to be the most problematic imagery, but it's a scene that is easily skipped. Now, regarding adult content, I've spent quite a lot of time really getting down to the bottom of this issue. I love movies, I love art, and sometimes an artist likes to depict certain things that, within certain contexts, are unsavory. Apart from art, things like nudity and violence can be heinous, but at other times can have value. Nudity within a marriage is romantic, and the violence required in defending a friend in harm's way can be heroic. But a film or photograph are always for the purpose of creating a film or a photograph, regardless of the message trying to be sent with the scene or photo. The nudity present isn't something unique to marriage, and at that point reaches a point of shame. In most cases I've experienced, and this is definitely something I'll humble myself to if I'm wrong, scripture paints a picture where nudity outside of marriage is shameful. That, or in regards to helping someone medically, is the only time when it seems appropriate for a real person in real life to be really naked in the presence of someone else. Otherwise, it seems to me that it's appropriate to assume it is shameful and sinful in those other cases. That said, what does it mean to watch a film with nudity in it? First, to really define this, I think it's a matter of learning about a film before watching it. Do I know the director? Has the director used adult content like this in his previous work? What does the IMDb Parents Guide say about the film? All of these things can help a viewer make an educated guess about whether it's something they can watch. But there's another aspect that needs to be applied. What about purpose? Why is there adult content in this film? What is it trying to say? For instance, violence in a film almost seems natural. We watch superhero films all the time where a hero is constantly in the midst of violent acts. 
However, unlike nudity, it's almost always fake violence. No one is actually getting hurt, but that doesn't necessarily mean a film isn't exploiting fictional acts of violence to glorify evil. A film like Cannibal Holocaust, despite seeking to be a commentary on news and reality television and the exploitation of the uncivilized, ultimately becomes what it seeks to critique based on how it chooses to portray its satire, especially when the film contains legitimate animal cruelty. Again, this is something that can be discerned by learning about a director, reading the IMDb Parents Guide, things like that. Knowing is half the battle. But what about nudity? Does purpose alter the use of nudity in film? Well, no. I, I think ultimately it doesn't. I think it can change the meaning portrayed in a narrative because it's an aspect of the narrative being told. But in the format of film, it contains the image of someone who is legitimately naked, and therefore it becomes a shameful thing. This is unlike a book, where a tasteful use of nudity explained in a narrative doesn't contain the image of a real person being naked. I think this is something we can glean from scripture when viewing it not only as God's word, but also the medium with which God's word has been told. He tells it through a book, and that book sometimes contains some very adult content. And I do recognize that the word of God is held to a different standard than man's because, you know, it's God's word. But I also know we're called to be like Christ, who is God, who wrote the word. So as we use our talents given to us from God, it's important to see the example that has been set for us. That said, we're still left without answering the question, what does it mean to watch a film with nudity in it? Well, I think there's three categories here to go over. And don't worry, I'll share my thoughts on It Follows immediately after this, so just bear with me. Number one, if you go into a film without knowing it has nudity in it, and then it just happens, you can look away, close your eyes, focus intently on the actor's face, which this is probably one of the dumber choices, or simply turn off the film. A movie isn't what saves your life, Christ is, so you don't have to finish that movie, you're okay. Number two, if you go into a film knowing there might be nudity in it, I think the above applies again, but the responsibility to guard your heart becomes more apparent. Has this director shown a consistent, exploitative approach to nudity? Has he put actors in highly provocative positions before? Number three, if you rewatch a film that has nudity, what are you saying about the film? Is the nudity worth enduring, or do you intend to skip the scene? How are you respecting the willful shame of someone who is performing naked on screen? I think you're starting to see that I'm not actually answering the question. Not because I think it's unanswerable, but because I think there's a lot of nuance to set on the table before really answering it. The reality is that when you turn the television on, or you buy a ticket and a scene with nudity arises, there is a responsibility to know how to approach that situation with wisdom. And perhaps I'm shoving my foot in my mouth when I say this, but sometimes to better understand how to engage a certain culture and deconstruct it with the purpose of reconstructing a biblical influence within it, you must endure unsavory aspects of that culture. And in this case, I think it means patiently looking away and respecting those who are doing something wrong so that you can turn around and do something right. And I'm going off script for a second to clarify. I don't mean respect as in let this person keep doing something evil so then I can just keep enjoying the movie. What I really mean is, like Genesis 9, we should turn away and then seek to cover up this person. And so when a scene like that happens in a film and you turn your head, it's a way of which saying, this is something I shouldn't be seeing. Let me look away for a second. And then when it's done, I can go back to watching the film and actually understanding what's trying to be said. Again, I am more than welcome to humble myself to being wrong here. This is simply how I've gone about tackling one of several problematic issues with cinema. There are plenty more we can discuss, but I think that's appropriate for another episode, as I've spent a lot of time talking about everything but the movie. At the very least, when entertaining it follows, I think despite its faults regarding nudity, it is in fact a good film. There's a real sense of focus that Mitchell employs throughout. Each aspect of the movie really emphasizes a proficiency most sophomore projects wish they had. This is made especially apparent when you learn that the majority of the post-production was completed in around three to four weeks. Mitchell and his team had to make a suitable edit, work on the score, input sound, VFX, etc., etc., all in time to submit for Critics Week at Cannes. To put that into perspective, most post-production can take upwards of six months to a year. 
That's impressive, and borders on unbelievable. Richard Vreeland, or as most people know him as Disaster Piece, puts together a wonderful soundtrack that fits the vibe so well. Most recognize him as the composer for video games like Fez or Hyper Light Drifter, and there are obvious references to Fez when listening to the soundtrack. Mitchell was in the midst of playing Fez while working on It Follows and found himself so enamored with the soundtrack he couldn't help but reach out to Vreeland about collaborating. He even used some of Fez's soundtrack as temp music during an early edit of the film to inspire Vreeland. And while it may not have been intentional, I think video games influenced It Follows in another manner. So, during a video game's development, tutorials are inevitable. Unless you're a series that's based on annual releases with little to no changes, you need to teach your player some concepts that may be unique to your title. This can either be completed by having a manual-like wall of text pop up and forcing your player to read it, having a character run you through a tutorial island, which is essentially something very clearly separate from the game's core experience, running you through mechanics, or perhaps something extremely subtle that teaches you without making it clear. For instance, I'm clearing some achievements in StarCraft II, so I replayed an early mission where, as the Terrans, I am up against some Protoss. For those of you who don't know, there are basically different futuristic races to play that have different abilities. Anyways, the Protoss need to build pylons to generate power for their buildings. However, if a pylon is removed, the power for those buildings is turned off, and they become ineffective. To teach the player this, the developers placed a pylon first, then two buildings behind it. It becomes obvious that I will target the pylon because it's the first thing in my way. Once it's destroyed, an animation is triggered that shows the buildings behind it powering down. This taught me exactly what it needed to do without popping open a wall of text or clearly stating that I was in a classroom. It follows as a similar instance of this. Mitchell knew that there was a specific way to enjoy his film, and he patiently teaches the audience how to engage with it. Early in the film, we see Jay on a date with Hugh, and the two of them end up going to a theater, and while they're in line, they play a game where you pick someone in the crowd, and the other person has two guesses to find out who it is. The criteria is that whoever you pick has to be someone you'd want to be. When the game begins, we're introduced to a populated point of view of our characters. Extras of all kinds are interacting with the scenery in very specific ways, and you're left scanning the scenery to figure out who our characters are thinking about. Guesses are made, and the scene continues up until a point when Hugh says to Jay, Oh, I I know who you'd want to be. You want to be that woman at the entrance. Jay answers, What woman? I don't see anybody. To which Hugh immediately requests that they leave. This scene is brilliant, and there's an irony to me explaining it, but I think the fact that it's teaching us to look out while watching this film speaks to a creative mind that not only loves films, but honestly probably loves video games too. And like a good video game, it's good that a film follows something similar. Pick a mechanic, so to speak, and run with it. And It Follows really pursues this style of horror well. From that point on, you're constantly watching the backgrounds, the extras, and peeking behind the walls, searching for the creature that will do nothing but follow our character with fatal intentions. The stress arises when you as the viewer spot the creature before your characters do, but, you know, they'll be okay, right? They just have to walk a little faster. That is, of course, if they notice it. And there's nothing quite new about this technique, although I do think that Mitchell's portrayal of this trope is what sets him apart. Anyone who has seen Carpenter's Halloween knows what it's like to always be watching. There's even a scene in It Follows that feels directly ripped from Halloween. Jay sits in her classroom in virtually the same seat Jamie Lee Curtis sat in her high school when she looked out the window to see a masked figure behind a car. Ignoring the fact that Jay's full name is Jamie... Mitchell clearly shows an intense love for Carpenter's work, but honestly, who can blame him? However, John Carpenter unwittingly employed this trope to Halloween. There was a sense of always looking to see if the shape was nearby, but sometimes scenes ran on a lot longer than intended. That, of course, was due to the fact that Halloween's original cut was way too short. So he decided to lengthen a lot of mundane scenes of walking to pan out the runtime. Ironically, something he did unintentionally added so much more to his film. Mitchell took that and turned it to 11, and honestly, more power to him. He envisioned what it would look like to go into a project with that sort of purpose, and it worked to his advantage. So much of this film is enhanced by how well it paces out, and I think that's something that most people step away with after the credits roll. They're left with this looming sense of always looking around, worrying that the creature may be following them, waiting for that moment when you let your guard down, only to find that it's been right in front of you this whole time. And to that end, what about the sexuality of this film? What is it trying to say about fornication? 
On my first watch, I stepped away confident that the film was attempting to personify the loss of innocence after fornication. Unlike most things we experience, there's something unique to the initial realization that you can never go back to a life before it. Like taking that first hit, you can never say you're straight edge anymore. It seemed to me that Mitchell was not only personifying, but hyperbolizing by taking the loss of innocence and turning it into a creature that ceaselessly haunts its prey. And then when you're just too tired emotionally to endure this great change in your life, you simply sit in a park and watch as the creature disguises your neighbor or cousin steadily walking toward you. Or you adapt. You grow callous, and like Hugh says, you pass it on to someone else. If you just keep doing it, you'll be alright. The fear subsides, and you think to yourself, if you just settle in with a promiscuous community, you could be rid of this guilt. That said, I had a slightly different experience with the film this time around. Part of that is due to the preparation I had for this episode, and I read a few interviews where Mitchell spoke about his purpose behind It Follows. Apart from wanting to make a film that's dreamy and spacious, he wanted to capture a sensation he experienced at a young age. A hyper-awareness of mortality. Sex is simply the catalyst with which his characters become aware of adulthood, so to speak. And that adulthood is essentially just waiting until death catches you. That's a horrible way to live. Mitchell is aware of this, though. He's showing characters struggle to pass it on. They find themselves in precarious situations where it'd be quite easy to embrace a callous lifestyle of debauchery. Yet these situations are always at risk of the character, let alone a risk outside of the film itself. Which reaches to another point he wanted to make, how the catalyst is both the thing that makes you aware of everything that's wrong, but also temporarily relieves you of having to think about it. And apart from Christ, what else can you do? If you live for sensual pleasures, then you're not only burying the problem, you're inviting others into it. If you're ignoring it, there's going to be a time when it comes back and overwhelms you. And even if you get through life without it coming back, you're still gonna die. Part of what makes this film so enjoyable is how it puts at the forefront this inalienable sense of existentialism, and Mitchell does this very well. And I know that in some cases that can seem overwhelming, at others highly pretentious. It's a gamble to pursue that route without making some sort of declaration about the world around you, as if to say you can't talk about existentialism without saying that an existential worldview is correct. But the film comes out on the other side virtually unscathed due to good actors, a a great soundtrack, moody pacing, a fascinating concept, and really just saying that at some point in your youth, you know, the the kids aren't all right anymore. And in a sense, he's right. We've all had a To Kill a Mockingbird moment in our lives where we see something or experience something that solidifies the broken nature of our world, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. In most cases, it's the first thing we need to start making things right, and I think that's why we hear about the whole of creation groaning in the pains of childbirth before reading a wonderful commonly used benediction at the end of Romans 8. But at risk of spoiling the film, I think it's about time to wrap this up. There's plenty more to discuss, like why characters are seen in a pool or at a beach in one scene and then later dressed heavily in winter clothes in another, or even the subtle nod to incel culture prior to its popularization as a legitimate issue. It Follows is a great film, and Mitchell daring to transport people back to grimier days is done with little to no fault, and most issues aside from the nudity can be easily accepted due to its dreamlike presentation. Now, as I conclude our first episode of Cinematic Doctrine, I want to share that I won't be giving scores at the end of my reviews. Most of my scores remain the same, but in some cases I do change them from time to time. Films can germinate differently, and while some remain the same, others can get better or worse with how I sit on them. So if you want to keep up with my scores, go ahead and follow my letterboxed account, uh, at Paraturtle. That's spelled P-A-R-A-T-U-R-T-L-E. You know, uh, a paracoupa, but it's a turtle instead. Also, I enjoy writing, and I have a finished novelette available on Wattpad. Same username, at Paraturtle. And if you're interested in reading a young adult modern fantasy about a high school kid who needs to make friends with people to keep them from dying, then boy, do I have a story for you. It's called Ethereal Temptation, and it's roughly 112 pages, I think, the last time I printed it out. I'll also have direct links for all of these things in the description, as well as a link to our Facebook page, which can be found at Cinematic Doctrine. In the meantime, I'll be seeing Jordan Peele's Us this weekend, so expect my thoughts on that next week. Thanks so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, stay cool.